Well, again, all God's people said, amen. Amen. It's great to be with you today. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can pull them out and turn them to Matthew chapter 18. We'll start with verse 15, Matthew 18. Verse 15, as I say, pretty much every week, we're a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. I think it's helpful to have your Bible with you. If you don't, don't worry about it. Pull out your phone, uh, and you can just Google Matthew 18 and follow along. As we actually are diving back into a series uh, that we've been for in for over two years, uh, walking through the gospel of Matthew verse by verse by verse as much as we possibly can. Now, as we journey through, we're actually in a section of Matthew in which Matthew's allowing us to see Jesus prepare the 12 disciples for ministry after he's gone. Now, in this section on preparation, we enter into an issue that Jesus is addressing for the next few passages that's specific to how they're going to lead the future church. Uh, G- Jesus knows what they're going to face. Uh, Jesus knows that even well-intentioned, full of the Holy Spirit, people have conflict. I'm going to say that again, church. Jesus knew that even well-intentioned, full of the Holy Spirit people will have conflict. And so he addresses some of the difficulties that they're going to encounter or we will encounter. And so this section could be called family business. So we're going to do some family business the next few weeks as we walk through uh, the next few passages in Matthew. Remember in the scriptures, we're called the church, the body of Christ, the family of God. We are all adopted brothers and sisters, a part of his family. We're co-heirs to the throne. And because life is messy and we're all still sinners, Jesus knows that once we begin to assemble as his family, like your family at home, although we still love each other, we're gonna have some problems. Yet thankfully, he gives us some instructions on how to deal with these issues because just like your family and my family, there are some conversations that we need to have that are just for the family's ears. This is household business. Kind of like if you've ever called a family meeting. These are difficult passages that are just for us, the church. And as we humbly submit to Christ, we need to discuss these. We can't skip over them. We need to engage in them lovingly. For again, these instructions do not come from some church denominational council somewhere. These instructions come from Jesus' mouth himself, who the Bible says Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He's the one in charge. See, one of the huge mistakes made by so many Christians in the American church is through the American lens, they believe their faith is only theirs. It's just their faith journey. I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we hear so much. Now let me be clear, faith for the sake of salvation is personal, that's between you and the Lord, meaning you're not grafted into the kingdom because you were born into a certain family or your dad was a pastor or you grew up in the church or you were baptized as a baby or you wear the right jersey today at the Super Bowl party. We're grafted into the family of God based on an individual profession of faith in Jesus Christ. So because of that truth, every one of us has to have a moment of clarity in which we individually recognize our sin, we recognize who Jesus is, Lord and Savior, and then turn to Christ. But this American concept that once in Christ, our faith is only personal and private, that you can't speak into my faith, that is a modern day American misnomer. It's very American as we live in the garage door, don't even know our neighbor's name, who are you to judge me generation, but it's biblical nonsense to suggest that we strive for Christ as an individual apart from the body of Christ. Rather, the Bible teaches we bring our individualism together and we form this singular thing called the church. So the Bible teaches that we are his ambassadors together. We are the aroma, singular, aroma of Christ together, the church together, that we put on the gospel in the world as one together. But because we're all still sinners, if we're honest, church isn't always pretty. I mean, wouldn't it be great if the gospel was we gave our lives to Christ and then we left sin behind and we're all perfect? And because now we as Christians in the church are all perfect, yeah, they're all sinners out there, but in here, we're all perfect, then in the church we live in perfect harmony without any disagreement or conflict. That would be great. I wanna lead that church. But that's not reality, especially these last two years. The reality is we often blow it. 
As Christians, we make mistakes, we say things we shouldn't, do things that hurt others. As your pastor, I also, as many of you know, succumb to the flesh. For me, it's usually a caveman outburst and anger. I know you can relate. You know, you're, you're living the Christian life, seemingly doing well, growing your faith, and then boom, out of nowhere, caveman outburst, temporary setback, whatever it might be for you. But that's the beauty of the gospel. This is what makes it so miraculous. It's the beauty of having Jesus as the head of the church. Because when those moments come, and they're gonna keep on coming until we die, or Jesus comes back, but God knowing this, he's given us tools, miraculous spiritual tools to convict us, to restore us, to redeem us, to heal us, to reconcile us, both as individuals and how we can find healing with the body of Christ. See, there are three primary means by which God is transforming us in the likeness of his son. One is his word. One is the Bible. This is one of the reasons why it's so important as an individual that you are spending some time in his word for when you are in the word and you begin to drift, he often convicts you. Therefore, because you love the Lord, you find yourself slowly but surely maybe getting out of your lane, but you get in early and often because the word convicts. Versus if you're not in the word at all, what often happens is you get so far outside your lane, you're in, you're in a big car crash. Another way we're being transformed, transformed is the Holy Spirit. It's one of the reasons why we need to be in prayer on a regular basis. I believe when you're in prayer regularly, you're more in tune to the Spirit of God. And what I, happens, what, what I find happens in my life is when I'm in prayer regularly and I do something out of line I shouldn't do or say, I almost always instantaneously hear the Spirit of the living God say to me, seriously? Now, he speaks to all of us different. That's his word for me. When I get out of line and do something I shouldn't do, he goes, seriously, Jess? Really? Did you just do that? Did you just say that? Did you just act like that? My immediate family, Team Smith Five, that's what we call ourselves, my wife and kids, if you ask them, they will tell you, I apologize a lot. Partly because I wanna show my kids that's the way you handle mistakes. Partly because I make so many of them. And so because of these realities that doing church together will cause conflict, he gives us these passages. Now, just a second ago, I, I said there's three primary ways that he uses to transform us into his likeness. I mentioned two so far, the word of God, the Holy Spirit. The third one is other believers. And that's what we're looking at today. As we come out of a series on discipleship, that is a follower of Jesus, doing life with other believers is at the core of our faith. This is one of the reasons why, what we're looking at today. For God transforms us through relationships. He puts others who love the Lord in our lives who will often see our blind spots. There are often things that are in our life uh, that are not good, that need to be addressed. Sometimes they're not addressed because we're on purpose running from them. Other times we just don't see them. So I want to start uh, our time today by telling you a story that I think we can all relate to that I think does a great job setting up our difficult passage. A few months ago, I was out to lunch with a friend. We're not super close. It's not like we spend a lot of time at each other's houses, but we have spent a lot of time together over the last 16 years that I've been at this church. Whether it's been a men's conference or equipping event or apologetic seminar or Sunday mornings, you name it. We spent a lot of time together and had a lot of conversations over the years. Well, as we were eating and talking, I noticed that he had this giant piece of lettuce wedged perfectly over one of his teeth, completely covered. It was actually miraculous. It looked like someone just knocked out his front tooth. Everything in me just wanted to stop and take a picture of what was happening. And as a little while, I noticed I was actually mesmerized by the piece of lettuce. <laughs> he might have been talking for a few minutes, I don't know, but I'm thinking, how did it get there? How does it fit so perfectly over that entire tooth? How can he not feel it? So now I'm trying to send him subliminal messages. I'm doing this, I'm like scratching my front tooth, gargling water. Hopefully somehow through osmosis, he'll know what I'm doing and it'll just go away, but it didn't. Now, I don't know why I didn't say anything. Honestly, I usually do, but about right at the time, I was gonna say, dude, let me take a picture because this is hilarious. The waitress came over and she said, hey, can I get anything else? And he looked at her and said, no, we're good. And he said, sir, you have a giant piece of lettuce right in your tooth. <laughs> and so he goes, oh, thanks. He goes like this and then he looks at her and goes, did I get it? He goes, not even close. <laughs> So he go, goes back in and digs it out, finally goes away, she leaves, and then he looks at me and said, dude, did you see that piece of lettuce? <laughs> and I had to sheepishly say, yes, I did. 
Why'd you just leave me hanging there? Were you ever gonna say anything? Now, I'm guessing because many of you are laughing, we've all experienced this on both sides of this conversation. Whether it's a guy's zipper that's down, something on his shirt, a big booger hanging out. The point is the same is true with our walk with Jesus. Like a piece of lettuce on the tooth that you can't see, God puts his people in our life to say, hey man, I love you. I know you love the Lord. Can you see this? This just happened to me about a year ago. I tell you all the time, I golf with a large group of guys. Uh, I'm mainly out there because I just, I, I just, it's my other place. I wanna have the opportunity to be around non-Christians and through the, the years have the opportunity to share Christ with them. And about a year ago, I had one of my friends who was a Christian that's in the group pull me aside after a round and say, hey man, I don't know if you've noticed this, but the last like couple months, you've been super intense on the golf course. Kind of not really fun to play with. Kind of angry a lot. And to be honest with you, I didn't see it. But that, I'm not out there for golf for the most part. I mean, I like golf and I like competition, but I'm out there to represent Christ well, and I was not doing that well. And I had a blind spot. And I had a believer pull me aside and show it to me. And because of that, I was able to address it. Listen, at times it can be hard to hear, but if we genuinely want to grow in the Lord, our response should be, I haven't seen that, but thank you. And then together we can grow in the Lord. So with all that said, welcome to Matthew 18, 15 through 21. This is one of the most overlooked, ignored, misapplied, misunderstood, to be frank with you, sometimes when misused as a weapon, one of the most hurtful passages in our Bible. And the thrust of the passage is answering the question, what's the most loving thing to do when you see a Christian brother or sister in Christ in sin? Either intentionally, they're in rebellion, or sometimes it's just a blind spot. What's the most loving thing to do when you're at lunch with someone and they have a huge piece of lettuce on their tooth? Although it can be difficult and awkward, the loving thing to do is to have a conversation. Now, this passage is often referred to as church discipline. We actually have in our documents as a church, we use the Bible holistically to come up with some theological and doctrinal uh, documents. One of them is called church discipline. We use this passage. Yet the problem with that term in our culture is it can turn people off, not understanding what the biblical understanding of discipline means. In our culture today, a lot of times when we hear this word discipline, we often think punishment. So it might even be church punishment, but that's not, that's not its intent, even though it's a bit, that's how it's been used at times to bring shame and destruction. But that's not what he's teaching here. A better way to define this concept maybe is care and correction. How do, you care, how do we care well for each other when we're going down a road we shouldn't, and then if we have to, what does correction look like? So let's dive into the text. Matthew 18, verse 15, it starts off and just simply says, if your brother sins against you. Now let me set the stage a little bit. Three things to understand about that statement, if your brother sins against you. One, I know it's Jesus and he is God, but it might have been better said when your brother sins against you. And the reason why I point this out is this passage is important for every single one of us as a follower of Jesus Christ. Because every single one of us as a follower of Jesus Christ, at some point in time, as a part of this family, you're gonna be in a situation like this. So many people think this is just for church leadership. It's not. If you're a follower of Jesus and you see a fellow believer in sin, he gives you some instructions. Secondly, it says, if a brother sins. In the original Greek, uh, they often use the word like uh, man, but it doesn't necessarily mean man, it meant mankind. When it's talking about, uh, in scripture, the, in the Greek it says brother, it often actually means brothers and sisters. And that's what it means here. It doesn't just mean a brother, it means anybody a part of the body of Christ. And then thirdly, it says when your brother sins against you. There's some get caught up in the against you part, thinking this is just a process that when you've been wronged by another believer, but that's not the intent of what Jesus is saying here. It's a process of care and correction, restoration and healing for any sin that you see a brother or sister in Christ in, regardless if it's against you, uh, for a couple reasons. One, uh, in the original manuscripts, there are some manuscripts that actually don't have that part of it. It just simply says, when you see a brother in sin. Uh, and then secondly, more importantly, the basic responsibility is the same. Because when you have a brother or sister in Christ, in the body of Christ, in sin, it does affect us all. So it needs to be addressed. So when you see a brother or sister in sin, we now have a process that Jesus gives us to follow. Now, this is an important sidestep. I've already said it, but let me say it again. This is family business. Uh, this is for brothers and sisters in the church. 
we are not called anywhere in scripture to hold non-Christians to a biblical standard. Nowhere in the New Testament does it tell us that we should sit down with non-Christians and call them to live as Jesus has called us to live. Listen, you and I, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We have a hard time doing this. Those who do not have the Holy Spirit living within them have absolutely no chance. The only thing we're called in scripture to do with the non-Christian in our life is to love them, to serve them, and when that opportunity arises, share the gospel with them. That being said, sometimes as Christians, we are in outright rebellion. Sometimes we're blind to our sin. Sometimes we just find ourselves slowly falling away from the Lord. Other times it's just old habits that keep coming up. So verse 15 tells us what to do. When we see a brother and sister in sin, it says, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. Now because you live in the American culture, because many of you have seen kind of church power completely misused, some of you are thinking, wait, are you suggesting that as a Christian, if I see someone in my life also uh, as a believer in sin, that I'm supposed to sit down with them and show them their fault? And you're thinking, if that's what you're suggesting, no way, no how, no chance for a million reasons. The problem with that is that's the case. If you who are close to this person, if you don't say something, the question then is when and who will? And I'll answer that question. When and who will? Because not many people are having these difficult conversations any longer. When issues finally come to light, when the quote unquote church leadership, if you will, gets win, oftentimes by that time, it's DEFCON 1. It's often by that time, it's an absolute da- disaster. Sometimes people have get, gone down that road for years and because of that, it just makes it so much more difficult and quite frankly, painful to bring restoration and healing. So what I believe Jesus is saying here is that, it, is that you're going to see some things in your friend's lives as you live for him together that the pastoral team will not often see. And because of that, it's the responsibility of every believer to have these kind of conversations when need be because this is family business. And the highest expression of love is not to keep your mouth shut, but to lovingly say something. Now, hopefully these conversations are rare, not because of what might be holding us back from having them, but because we are creating a culture as we live together in discipleship, we do so humbly in repentance before God. By the way, this is a a huge reason, what we're talking about right now is a huge reason why you need to be connected to a local body of Christ. It's a huge reason why people need to know you and you need to know others. It's why we need to physically assemble and you need to be in some kind of group life because if other believers around you don't know you, who's gonna point out the blind spots in your life? And I think that's what's happening to so many believers, especially in this day and age. They don't have anybody that actually knows them to have these difficult conversations. So we can challenge each other that we are reading our Bibles by ourselves. And so when I'm reading the Bible and it tells me how I'm to treat my wife and I find myself having a bit of an attitude, well, then I go and apologize. Or because I'm in regular prayer and someone's challenging me on that and I'm doing something I shouldn't do and I hear seriously, I go and make those things right. My friends, we need to, as the body of Christ, keep our accounts with the Lord and others short. Because then these conversations simply just don't need to happen. With that said, let me share a few reasons that keep some of us from having these conversations. As I've already said, uh, many in the American church have misunderstood the nature of faith. We think it's none of your business. It's personal and private. This is my faith, you have your faith, and so a sense, we don't speak into, into, each other, in, 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 into each other's lives. Again, that sounds very American. I'm just telling you that's not biblical Christianity. Secondly, and I think this is the real big one. I think the real big one that keeps us from having this difficult conversation is we have a fear that we'll be perceived as being judgmental. That's the big American term, you're being judgmental. In our American culture, almost any time you try to speak into a person's life about something that might be right, the response is almost always, that's judgmental, without really even understanding what that word means. Secondly, I think we do need to be a bit honest. The big C church, you know, the global body of Christ over the last who knows how many dec- decades, we have handled some situations incredibly poorly publicly by authoritatively saying and doing things in the name of the church, in the name of Jesus, that have been incredibly harmful, punitive, and judgmental. And so if we have these conversations that could look anything like something like that, we often get a stiff arm. And then thirdly, I think many of us are thinking, 
Well, who am I to say anything? You know, I got my own issues, I got my own problems, I've got a long way to go, which just as a side note, I think you all know this, but if you wait till you have it all together to have a difficult conversation with a friend, when's it gonna happen? Never. This is one of the most difficult passages, sometimes misused, but I actually think there's one that's even more misused. It's in Matthew 7, when Jesus says this, do not judge or you will be judged. I hear this verse more than any verse in the American culture. This is one verse all of our non-Christian friends have memorized. I don't hear John 3, 16 very often, but anytime I hear somebody saying something wrong, they'll say, well, Jesus said, don't judge or you'll be judged. But they stop right there. They don't even have any understanding of the rest of the passage. Jesus goes on to say there, by the way, for in the same way you judge, you will be judged, and with the same standard of measure you use, it will be used towards you. Jesus is not saying don't sit down and have these conversations. He's not saying don't point out difficult sin. No, what he's saying is make sure with the help of the Holy Spirit, you have the same standards for yourself. He goes on to say, you're pointing out the speck in your friend's eye, but you got a giant plank in yours. What's he go on to say? Well, then you need to deal with the plank. Why? So you can help your brother with his speck. He's not saying don't have the conversations. He's, make, he's saying make, make sure your heart is right. He's saying don't sit down with a brother and say, hey man, you shouldn't be having an affair on your, with, uh, on your wife if you're having an affair. When I have this conversation, I always start with something like, hey man, I, I'm not perfect. I know there's things in my life that are out of whack. I, I'm not having this conversation with you because I think I'm better than you in any kind of way. And if you see something in my life, please point it out. I, I wanna grow, I wanna be better but I see this thing in your life that's not quite right. I'm, my friends, that's not judgmental. Nowhere in scripture does it say having these conversations is being judgmental as our American culture defines it. What it does say is don't have these conversations if you're not willing to humbly work on issues of your own. Another reason why I think people avoid these conversations, frankly, is they just don't want to be held accountable themselves. Because the second we decide to speak into somebody else's life, we're giving them the right to do what? Speak into ours. And so what we do often in the American church, we say, hey, let's make a deal. We don't actually verbally agree on it, but it's what we do. We say, you do you, I'll do me. You stay in your lane, I'll stay in mine. Then we can do whatever we want, Monday through Saturday, sometimes even together. And then on Sunday, we'll come together, worship God, and it will be awesome. I have a friend in Fresno, he said it this way. Many American Christianity are essentially saying, I want to be godly enough that it feels good, but not godly enough that it changes my life. I want to love Jesus enough that I sense his pleasure, but not enough that I sense his conviction. Where are you at? I think there's many other reasons but let me just, before I move on, state a couple practical do's and don'ts. Number one, in the passage it says, do this in private. Now I think there's wisdom at times to pull a small circle of people together and just ask some advice. You just have to check why you're doing it. Is it for some kind of gossip reasons or are you truly seeking like help? You know, this is definitely not one of those moments that you share in, you know, in the prayer meeting. Hey, we just need to pray for Heather. You know, she's flirting with the guy at work even though she's married. That's not really, and Heather's sitting right there. That's, that's not what this is saying, in private. And by the way, in person. This is not a text conversation. Secondly, make sure the fault is biblical, meaning that you can go to scripture and say, this part of your life is off base and this is what scripture says. Just because they may have eaten too many chips tonight at the Super Bowl party and they broke their diet doesn't mean it's time for this conversation. Now, it doesn't say this in scripture, but I think a third wise counsel in this area is I would suggest it is a guy to guy, girl to girl. I said guys have this conversation with guys and girls have these conversations with girls. And I only say that because uh, when you sit down with the opposite sex to have some kind of confrontational conversation, it can just get weird in a thousand ways. Fourth, I would encourage you to make, sh make sure you're not the person that's always having this conversation. If you're always having this conversation, I, I would step back and ask, do you like having this conversation? 
Because if you like having this conversation, I would probably argue you're doing it for the wrong reason. Make sure it's not white noise. I was watching this show once and it was kind of like a friend show and there's like these five friends that hang out all the time. And they, the whole show was about, they were having interventions with each other. And they had this big banner and it said intervention. And, and a guy walked in and it's like, what's this one about? Well, you, re- you, know, you wear your red boots too much. And then this, that, you wear those jeans too much. And they were just having all these dumb interventions. And finally, the last one, there's an intervention and the guy walks in because he wasn't at work. He had all this time on his life, uh, time on his hands. He walks in, he's like, what's this about? He's like, we need to have an intervention because you're having too many interventions. <laughs> And I think if you're a person that's just constantly having this conversation, it just becomes white noise. Now, it doesn't always work out like you had hoped. Verse 15 goes on to say, if he listens to you, you've won your brother over, amen? But 16 goes on to say, but if you will not listen, take one or two others along so that, notice, quote, unquote, every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. It's quoting the Old Testament. So you get the courage, you go to your friend, you lovingly lay it out the best of your ability, they give you the spiritual stiff arm, they tell you to take a hike, they might even get mad at you. First, I would tell you this, if someone gets mad at you, I would just, as much as you can, don't take it personal. I know it's hard, but you just have to remember, it's just the natural response of every human being to give the defense stiff arm when confronted. I've had this conversation a couple times where maybe a two, couple days go by, maybe even a week, and someone calls me and says, hey man, I just, sorry for my first response. I've really thought about what was said, and I really appreciate the conversation. Just allow the spirit to do a work in someone's life. But if they continue not to listen, get, it tells us to get a couple of friends and have the conversation. Why? What you're doing is saying it's not personal. Uh, my goal is here not to hurt you. I love you. You got this thing in your tooth. You don't believe it's there, so I brought a couple other people that love you as well that will tell you I'm not crazy, they see it too. And again, if you read, the assumption is if, if they turn, if they repent, you've won your brother over. But verse 17 goes on to say, if he still refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. What, do they, what does he mean by that? This is where specifically this has been misused in history. Does this mean that you now bring up the person on stage and tell the whole church what they've done? If you can believe it, that's been done in churches. That's not what it's saying. It means let the church leadership in on it so they can figure out what's going on and take it from there. Now I'll say this, there are, there are times, maybe once, twice a year that we get to this point and uh, we get the, the pastoral staff together and we have a conversation, we prayerfully discuss it, what's the best way, and then we reach out to this person. And I'll just tell you this, take a guess what almost always happens next. One of us as the pastoral team contacts them and says, hey, we'd like to sit down and have a conversation. Guess what almost always happens next? They leave the church. Almost every time. I need to tell you, that's not our goal. We want redemption, we want restoration, but it often happens because they don't wanna hear it. They wanna live away apart from the word of God with the path of least resistance, so they pick up, go, hide with their sin in another church. Now, there have been some meetings, I'll be honest, that we have these discussions, it gets to that point, and there is a light bulb, there's a scales that get pulled back. The Holy Spirit does a great work through prayer, and there's, there's a repentance, and I'm telling you, that's the gospel. It's, it's the miracles we've seen, the restoration, the healing, the reconciliation that can take place when somebody repents. Now, again, It doesn't always happen. So verse 17 goes on to say, if he refuses to listen even to the church, what's it say? Treat him as you would a pagan or tax collector. Yeah, this is one of those quotes you don't hear of Jesus much in our culture. What does he mean by this? Are we to treat them badly somehow? No, let it play out a bit. If a person rejects the authority of the word of God, rejects the conviction of the Holy Spirit, rejects the loving reproof of a believer, a friend, rejects the loving reproof of several believers, rejects the spiritual authority of the church, that assumes a lot. Reject, 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 reject. The question now is this, is that person actually have a relationship with Jesus? That's the question. Only God knows, but they're demonstrating a life that's not submitted to God. So treat them like a pagan or tax collector, which simply means treat them like a non-Christian. Let me ask you this. How did Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? Now, he treated religious leaders pretty harshly at times, did he not? Show me a passage where he treats a pagan or a tax collector harshly. He doesn't. He treats them incredible grace and love. 
So this isn't a, hey, you're out of here. It's more of a, you're welcome to attend, but you need to know that you're not evidencing a life that's submitted to the Lord Jesus. And so I would say, you know, baptism is not for you. Communion's not for you. Leadership within the church is, is not for you. You're not submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But let's have some conversations about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's have a conversation about the gospel. What is it? Maybe you don't quite get it. And the goal would be that they would actually become a follower of Jesus. By what authority do we do this? I've had people get super mad, call me super judgmental. Well, let's look at the rest of the passage. It tells us what authority we do this. 18, I tell the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Now listen, this is not a passage about prayer. I know everyone thinks it is, but that's not what this is teaching. In context, it's about care and correction. It's also not saying that, you know, Jesus conforms to the decisions of the church. What it's saying is if the church obeys the Lord, walks through a prayerful biblical process that he has led them through, he has already led them to the decision that needs to be made, so he is there and it is bound. And it goes on in verse 20 to say, for where there are two, three come together in my name, there I am with you. It's not teaching that two of us come together and somehow God's specially with us now. Listen, the Holy Spirit, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he is with you as much as he's always gonna be with you anywhere you go. What it's teaching is that as you come together and have these difficult conversations, he will speak to you through this biblical process to multiple people together. So if you agree through this process, I'm with you. Now real quickly with the time that I have left, which is none, when might we ask a person to leave the church? We've had to do this a couple of times. So why, when would we get there? I don't have time to unpack 1 Corinthians 5 right now, but what it really comes down to is we've walked through this entire process and that person continues to uh, live in their sin and, and be defiant but then they're also hurting people within the church. I'll give you a classic example of a friend of mine. I, I've known this guy pretty much my entire life. He gets married, divorces her without any biblical cause, then gets remarried against all advice, and then they're struggling in marriage. She's not a Christian. They start coming here. Uh, they're having issues, and then he leaves her. She just comes, to, she's a baby believer now. She's coming to church. She's attending one of these services. And then he starts coming up too. He's coming to the services. He's ignored everything we've talked about. Then he starts making advances to women in our church. And so we pulled him in after all these conversations that we've already had and said, hey, dude, <laughs> you've ignored everything we've said. You're living in defiance to the word of God. I don't see an evidence of an actual relationship with the Lord. You're welcome to attend here as long as you're not causing problems, but now you're causing problems within the body of Christ. You're hurting people, let alone your wife. If you continue to do this, you can't be here. And he refused to listen, and we had to ask him to leave. With all that said, I'll tell you this. I'd like to tell you this is always done incredibly well. None of us are perfect and life is messy. But what I can commit to you, if this is your home, if this is your church, on the behalf of the elders, leaders, pastors, we commit to love the body of Christ the best we can. And as we make that commitment to oversee care and correction, we commit to a process that's driven by love, that's bathed in prayer, is pursued with grace and humility, that's affirmed in community, and is restorative in nature, meaning the goal is never punishment. The goal is always restoration, reconciliation, and redemption. Because in the end, that exalts Christ. Let's pray. Lord, uh, this is a super technical passage, so I pray for the person that this is their first time coming to our church. I would just pray that they understand that we just walk through scripture, we allow scripture to come up and what's next is what's next. And Lord, although this is not a Jesus loves me passage, Lord, what it is is it's, it's, it's a, a, a passage you've given us to handle conflict, to handle sin. And so Lord, we, we believe that 
You're our Lord, you, you are the head of the church. And so Lord, we ask, I say out loud, please help us deal with these issues in an absolutely gracious, restorative, redemptive, Jesus Christ way. We wanna represent you well. But we also believe, Lord, you've given us instructions uh, to address these issues, and so we know that, we know, Lord, that your way is the right way. Lord, I wanna pray for that person in this room right now that's struggling maybe with something I said, or maybe even more so, someone's had a conversation with them, and it's been difficult, it's been hard. Lord, whether it's right or wrong, I would just pray, Lord, that if there's truth being said, that they'd be open to it. That they know, although maybe they're wrong in this situation, Lord, we all make mistakes. None of us are perfect. And we just need people in our life to point out at times the lettuce in our teeth. Lord, help us create an atmosphere here at River City Christian that we can have these conversations and they're received warmly with love. Lord, let us handle your word well. Let us never use it as a battering ram. So Father God, I pray that we would be a, 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 a body of Christ that's about redemption, restoration, and healing. For the person in the room, Lord, that needs reconciliation with another believer, Lord, I would pray that you would give them the courage to have a difficult conversation about that. Maybe someone hurt them in the church years ago and handled this incredibly poorly. Lord, I pray for that person that's been hurt by the church, Lord, that they'd understand that, that although they may have been hurt, the church doesn't always do things well. You still love them, you care for them, you want a relationship with them, you want them to be part of the body. So God, I just pray that you would bless us as we go, help us handle these difficult situations with grace, and humility. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. hey, God bless you. Uh, hope to see you next Sunday. We're gonna uh, unpack the next passage, which is on forgiveness. And so I think that's a, a great part two to what we're handling in family business. Have a great Sunday afternoon.